Why don't I get started with introductions? I'm sure a few more people will join, but it will take us a few minutes to introduce everything. My name is Sri Joy Mahapatra. I am uh, MIT class of 94, uh, course 6-1, and then uh, MBA 2015, so a bit of a gap there. And I am the uh, president of the MIT Club of Minnesota. We're a relatively small club, but we try to do some online events. We really appreciate it, especially when we get uh, some of one of our own, uh, Tim Connors, to speak, as well as someone from outside of our club. Uh, both Hamara Ledley and uh, Sarah Simon have agreed to join us, and they're, they're going to be both very helpful to us. So today's uh, topic is primarily about, uh, I'll say the word climate change, although we're using uh, Bill Gates' latest book to help us uh, sort of frame the conversation. So first I want to turn it over to Sarah to briefly introduce her organization and tell us a little about it, and then we'll move on to our main speakers. So uh, go ahead, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Sri Joy. My name's Sarah Simon, I'm class of 72. Back then it was just civil engineering, not civil and environmental, but I did spend my career in environmental compliance. I am coordinator for the network of alumni that is the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Network. Our whole goal is to connect alums around the issues in our name, energy, environment and, envir and sustainability, and to help them work together in, in different ways. So. We like to do monthly webinars. We have a web page on the Alumni Association platform, and we would welcome you at any one of them. We'll put some of the um, uh, website links in the in the chat a little bit later. But uh, tonight we, we we are delighted to be joining with the Club of Minnesota to to feature two alums uh, who will guide us through a discussion of Bill Gates' new book, Avoiding Climate Disaster. And when it popped up, it was kind of interesting to me because myself and many of the folks who have been going to the EESN lectures have been looking at lots of different aspects about this question, uh, whether it's clean energy or uh, environmental impacts like flooding and droughts, or even just the whole issue of sustainability, how we're gonna transfer our whole society to thinking in longer terms, uh, to thinking about what we do now, how is it going to affect things 30 and 40 years from now? So we're delighted to have this chance to partner with the Club of Minnesota. And uh, um, as I understand it, we'll all be able to talk and ask questions in the chat, but Sri Joy, I think is going to go over some of that. Thank you, Sri Joy. Thank you. So uh, to bring that up, yes, we're asked everyone to stay muted, uh, just to prevent chatter. Um, you definitely ask questions through the chat. I'll be monitoring that, although we'll be taking the questions at the end. We have two speakers. I'm gonna start with Tim Connors, um, who's class of 87. He is a local alumni uh, here in Minnesota. He's an active member of a number of climate action groups, uh, including the EESN. And he's also um, got a degree from our local University of Minnesota, where I think you still have some affiliation. So Tim, why don't you start and uh, I'll let you go and I'm, there's a few people who are apparently pinging me wanting the link, so I'm going to send them the link. So you may see me turn my ear, eyes to the left. Very good. Thanks, Sir Joy. I uh, wanted to also uh, introduce the other person that's going to assist me. I've had a, you know, a long career in business, um, worked in the energy markets, uh, had some understanding of what was going on with uh, power generation in particular. Uh, but over the last couple of years, I've been a student of the climate topic. And when I say a student, much of what I've learned, I've learned from uh, Tamara. So I uh, wanted you to let you know that uh, Tamara is the, uh, the real climate expert here if we uh, need some answers to questions. Tamara is a STEM consultant, uh, education consultant. Uh, she's an earth and climate scientist and an adjunct professor at Bentley University. Uh, a long list of activities that are tied to climate uh, based on her experience and her expertise. Uh, and uh, she is also um, president, and, uh, president and chairman of the board of directors of the Earth Science Information Partners, uh, a group inspired by NASA that uh, brought a bunch of people together. She's uh, got a number of other awards and such, and so is a very accomplished individual when it comes to climate topics. Um, and again, um, I'm, I'm her uh, student. <laughs> With that said, uh, the spirit of tonight's um, uh, conversation is just to look at the uh, Gates book, see what it says, 
Uh, I will comment at the front end. Um, I don't agree with everything that uh, gets said in the book. Uh, uh, and uh, so I'm interested in how it's been received by other people. Uh, if you haven't read it, that's okay. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is summarize its contents with the idea that uh, towards the end, then we'll uh, have a back and forth conversation uh, with uh, Sorojoy uh, uh, kind of moderating the questions and answers. Uh, with that said, uh, I will get underway by sharing my screen and beginning the formal presentation. All right, am I live there, uh, anybody? All right, here we go. So Bill Gates, is he a visionary or what is he? Um, his book is entitled, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, 51 Billion to Zero. As just context, I'm gonna go through two slides here. Uh, this slide helps us think about the 51 billion. And what it's saying is uh, uh, we are at a point now where we're emitting 51 billion. Uh, the emissions are at a, a level of 51 billion uh, uh, tons beyond what they have historically been. And so as a consequence, um, you see a spike in the atmosphere from where it used to be under 300 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. The Tim, directors... I'll just make one, one yeah, comment. Is that you said 51 billion tons. I think it's 51 billion gigatons. Gigatons, it's right. Order of magnitudes more. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tamara. <laughs> and now you know why Tamara's on. So, all right. 51 billion gigatons, what does that do to the atmosphere? It warms it up. And here's a, a similar graph just showing that since we've spiked um, the, the amount of emissions going into the atmosphere, here's what's happened to temperature. And likewise, it started to trend up. So that's the basic concern. What happens when you, you end up with higher temperatures? Well, lots of things start to happen. And, he uh, talks a little bit about that in the book. So 51 billion to zero is the current rate of greenhouse emissions that 51 billion, once emitted, it stays in the atmosphere for a long, long time. Zero, the idea behind the zero is to arrest the increase in temperatures by returning the ecosystem to those mid 18th century um, levels. And to start doing that, the first thing we gotta do is get to zero emissions. Now, if we're at a high level of um, emissions for the next few years, and we will be, there's really no way to prevent that. Um, once we get to zero emissions, the argument will be that we need to actually re, uh, take emissions out of the air and uh, reverse the, uh, what's been going on to actually get back to the 18th century level. Uh, the next point uh, Bill makes is a little is a lot. Little temperature change results in significant consequences compared to the day. The ice age was only six degrees cooler and the dinosaur age was only four degrees warmer. And at the point where the dinosaur age occurred and it was four degrees warmer, alligators were living north of the Arctic Circle. So you can imagine how dramatic that impact is. So what happens if uh, we uh, choose 51 billion in terms of gigatons of emissions instead of reducing to zero? Uh, mortality, this would uh, result in mortality rates more deadly than COVID by 2050. And the cost impact would be 0.85% to 1.5% of GNP by 2030. It's not a free thing. In essence, we're going to pay for not reducing emissions. In essence, that's the equivalent of one COVID event a decade, just to put it into perspective. However, if we choose zero instead of 51 billion, the possibility exists for zero carbon companies to be startups that literally lead the global economy. And we can already see some evidence of that happening. Some of the uh, companies are already starting to lead based on their focus on uh, trying to help us get to zero emissions. Again, back to Bill's words, how to avoid a climate disaster. Three things. One, get to net zero. <laughs> Two, 
We need to deploy the tools we already have, like solar and wind. And three, we need to create and roll out breakthrough technologies that can take us the rest of the way there. And if you're not aware of Bill's work, he's um, basically funding a number of ventures that are all directed at getting uh, new technologies to market that can help us with emissions. So he serves up five questions. When we think about what's going on with climate, we wanna think about how we plug in electricity, how we make things, cement, steel, plastic, how we grow things, plants and animals, how we get around transportation and how we keep warm and cool. All those have an impact, which leads to the question, well, how much does it cost to do those things differently? Admittedly, premiums are a moving target and to know exactly how much stuff costs is not always clear. However, Bill presents the basic strategy, build out technologies that are cost competitive today, things like solar and wind, and do R&D on technologies that are not cost competitive. Countries that do R&D will create new products and export business, and will be the organization, or I'm sorry, the locations in the world that will lead the economies of the world is his basic uh, uh, put. Things like zero carbon cement or green hydrogen are already in motion with companies that are investing in those technologies. And he sees them as the future leaders of uh, business. The five tips, convert emissions to a percentage of the 51 billion gigatons. Uh, the point here is if you wanna kind of understand where the impact is, that percentage helps you think about, you know, what the biggest hits are, where we can actually get the most benefit. So find solutions in all five of those activities based on a percentage of the 51 billion. He also gives you a hint, you know, we're gonna have to think about this at a house level, you know, at our homes, within the city we live in and within our countries. And so he, uh, uh, suggest to people think in terms of kilowatts when you're at home, thinks in terms of gigawatts when you're in a mid-sized city, but when you're thinking in terms of a country, it's hundreds of gigawatts. Another thing to think about is space for solutions. It turns out some technologies take a lot of space. Wind and solar are actually examples of that. Other technologies take very little space. And then think about green premiums. We talked about how there's a benefit, we can reduce the cost of the economy if we get ahead of this emissions thing, but it's not free. We'll still have to pay premiums for some of the things that get done. And so in particular, it'll be important to think about that as we think about middle income countries and how they pay the bill. All right, back to the five things. How do we plug in? We love electricity, we rely on it. Uh, you know, there's virtually no chance that the world will quit using computers, quit using HVAC in their homes, quit looking at TVs, quit lighting our streets, uh, quit running our manufacturing plants. So, you know, we need to think about electricity. With that said, the, the pie chart on the right talks about where electricity comes from today. And of course, the innuendo is some of those uh, uh, sources of electricity create greenhouse uh, emissions and some don't. So changing that pie to be a pie that's mostly uh, sources of electricity that don't emit is part of the solution. How do we make things? Uh, cement, steel, plastics, all represent examples of things that we need to make. Uh, obviously, uh, Shanghai's probably built uh, as much as it, well, I don't know if it's built as much as it can be, but you can see the dramatic difference in just a short period of time. Shanghai built up dramatically and used a lot of cement and steel. That phenomena will continue to repeat as other locations in the world uh, become uh, uh, part of uh, uh, you know, the success of our world uh, economy. With that said, thinking about um, emissions of those items, steel puts out um, 
about an equivalent amount of emissions as uh, about 1.3 tons of plastic or 1.8 tons of cement, all of them put out enough emissions where they make significant contributions. And of course that leads to the point, we need to think about how those materials are made and, if, and ways to minimize uh, the amount of emissions required to make them because cities like Shanghai are gonna to continue to pop up. How we grow things. Well, a lot of times you hear people talk about trees and trees are something that can contribute to uh, emission reductions, but trees have to be the right trees. They have to be in the right place or they have minimal impact. Fertilizer, another thing that has a big impact on uh, emissions. Hard to displace. I doubt that we'll uh, make a rule that nobody can use fertilizer, but we can use things like precision ag to make sure that the fertilizer ends up in the right place. And then meat uh, is a big contributor. And you're already seeing some entrepreneurs bring out alternatives to meat that taste like meat. Why? Well, they represent a big contributor to emissions. And, uh, and so people are trying to find ways to uh, move people towards healthier diets. That's a co-benefit, a uh, healthier diet, but it also uh, reduces emissions. How we get around is another way to think about uh, what we need to do. With that said here, a couple quick questions just to stimulate your uh, minds as I'm starting to drone on. Which contains the most energy? A gallon of gas, a stick of dynamite, a hand grenade? And which is the cheapest? A gallon of milk, a gallon of orange juice, or a gallon of gas? Well, it turns out a gallon of gas contains more energy than a stick of dynamite or a grenade, and it's cheaper than a gallon of milk or orange juice. So that's something to think about because we know that a gallon of gas does emit uh, greenhouse gases and think of the implications of not using gasoline. And so what we need to think about is what we do to keep the economy moving ahead, but also um, understand how uh, big an impact gasoline had on our economy. How we get around, um, already a lot of changes happening in personal transportation. There are many that expect uh, personal vehicles to basically be cost competitive from an electric vehicle standpoint with cars that have internal combustion engines by 2024. So if that happens, and uh, if it doesn't happen in 2024, I think everybody's sure that it's gonna happen by 2025. Uh, basically, you'll be able to buy the electric vehicle for the same price as a car that has a traditional internal combustion engine, but it'll cost less to run. Ergo, that starts the transition. However, small cars are powered by batteries. It gets a little tougher to run around big trucks for long distances with batteries. So what's the solution there? A lot of people are talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen is, would I be a prognosticator and make a bet on hydrogen? Probably I'd go 50-50 bet, maybe a little more than that. I, I think hydrogen has potential, but you know that's one of the uncertainties. With that said, there are a number of trucks over the road running on hydrogen today. And in Germany, you can actually get on a commuter train that's run by hydrogen. How do we keep warm and cool? You know, again, being hot or cold is not an option. And as more global wealth uh, is created, as it is, uh, you know, heading, uh, that will accelerate the use of HVAC. So uh, what, uh, what are some of the headwinds? Um, you know, even here in the US, heat pumps are advancing north because they are becoming uh, more effective as time goes on. Um, there are a number of other technologies that we can look at in terms of how we build our buildings and our houses and, and such. Um, with that said, of course, there are some headwinds. There's a lot of buildings there today. There's a lot of HVAC systems there today. And upgrades happen very infrequently. Um, so we need to think about what we do in the area of uh, HVAC that uh, speeds up the transition to deal with it. 
All right, those are the five things to think about, but there's one other item here that uh, Bill brings up, and this is commonly brought up by a number of people in the, in the uh, uh, field. And that is, what do we do about ad adaptations? And the reason adaptations are important is because we're not gonna stop the emissions fast enough to prevent some of the ill effects. So uh, we need to think in terms of adaptation, adaptation as a means of dealing with the climate change. Um, an example of that is, uh, and many of you may remember um, Norman Borlaug. He was a gentleman actually who uh, came out of the University of Minnesota that did some of the first work in increasing the um, yields of wheat. And as a result, turned Mexico from a net importer of wheat to a net exporter. Uh, Norman's uh, work has been kind of absorbed into a larger group called CGIAR, and it's a number of groups, 15 active members in a consortium that are basically working to find ways to make drought resistant uh, crops and also uh, crops that can survive uh, heavy floods. An example of that would be scuba rice that can be underwater for a couple of weeks before it uh, has problems resurfacing and growing. Um, so whether it be droughts or floods, they're working on ways to adapt to the changes that are coming with climate. Um, cities, uh, they are uh, potentially able to put together plans where they think about floodplains. Flooding is gonna be more common in certain regions, probably not places to build. We need to leave forests in place to leave them to absorb carbon. And we need to think about wetlands that can absorb rainfall to uh, prevent uh, uh, shortages of water. Um, water is gonna get harder to find, so we need to think about that. In this area of adaptations, there's actually been some research done that uh, Bill refers to, and he comments that if we spent 1.8 trillion on adaptations between 20 and 2030, the expected return for those investments is to the tune of seven trillion. Unfortunately, it's hard to find funding for that kind of work. And so that's really, uh, he positions that uh, as something that, where government should invest. Government po policies, they matter. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, air pollution and health issues were somewhat rampant in various countries. And as a result, those countries started to deal with it. In 1956, Britain passed the Clean Air Act. In 1963, the US passed the Clean Air Act. And in 1970, the US EPA was formed. All those were policy initiatives that had a substantive impact on the air we breathe. He draws the corollary that with emissions, we can similarly go down that path of leveraging our uh, uh, federal government to put us in a position where we're starting to address the emissions challenge. Um, he also talked about electrification and how in 40 years, uh, the US government electrified the nation as another example. So what's the government's role? He sees it as investing in R&D, leveling the playing field by stopping fossil fuel subsidies, uh, helping get over market barriers, uh, things like codes and new appliances, uh, push for up-to-date uh, regulations and codes there, and plan for just job transitions. As uh, some know, the uh, coal areas of our country are uh, gonna experience uh, huge job losses. In some cases, they already have, and getting those people retrained or relocated and moving into new jobs is another piece of the uh, government role. If we take the markets, you know, there are market forces in action. Uh, if we take technology and work on it to bring new technology to market, and if the government takes off, uh, takes on the policy challenge, that's the three-legged stool that uh, Bill Gates sees as important to addressing this climate challenge. So, in his view, the plan then for new tech and R&D is to quintuple clean energy R&D from where it is today. Move ahead with government funded bigger bets where there's a lot of uh, uh, risk, so to speak, 
And his example of uh, success is the uh, Department of Energy's Sunshot, Sunshot Initiative that targeted reducing the cost of solar cells by 75% and uh, actually achieved that goal uh, before the 10 year time frame they'd uh, set as a goal. Um, and then work with the industry from the beginning because when the government and industry work together, that speeds innovation. So which tech? He's got 20 listed. Uh, some of them are here, hydrogen, grid scale storage, electrofuels, next gen fission, fusion, zero carbon, cement, steel, plastic, thermal storage, drought resistant crops, uh, coolants without F gases. F gases are particularly kind of tough uh, uh, greenhouse gas, very potent and, and uh, have a, a very uh, big impact. So those are examples of the technologies he sees as needing uh, funding uh, immediately kind of thing. So to accelerate demand though, uh, in addition to doing the R&D, uh, the government can also use procurement to drive demand into new innovations. And actually you're seeing that with some policy initiatives now to move towards EVs as part of the uh, government fleets, um, incent businesses to go green, build infrastructure, of course, the grid is a key to this whole electrification activity, uh, getting some charging stations out there to kind of prime the pump and uh, pipelines for CO2 and hydrogen so we can move those gases around. Change rules to make 20th century tech competitive. The public utility commissions need rule changes to really look at the grid and transmission and distribution of power and uh, bring it into the 20th century a price on carbon, expand the clean electricity standards. Uh, they already exist in 29 states and in Europe, uh, but expanding them further. Clean fuel standards, accelerate electrification, clean product standards, so that we move towards uh, less impactful versions of cement, steel, and plastic, and uh, get out of the old, retire the fossil fuel plants as, uh, ahead of schedule uh, as fast as we can. So Bill encourages us all, call, write your federal, state, and local policymakers, <laughs> run for office, um, exercise your consumer power, buy green electricity, reduce home emissions, buy an electric car, try a plant-based burger. Uh, businesses set up internal uh, carbon taxes within your business, prioritize low carbon innovation, be an early adopter, uh, engage in policymaking with government to get basic R&D done and support early stage innovators, uh, help them with facilities and insights. Most importantly, he talks about depolarization of the conversation. The US has been uh, historically quite polarized on the topic, but uh, part of the path to moving to a new place is basically depolarizing that conversation. So Tim, as you're right. uh, uh, wrapping up, I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat if they have any, but I want you to continue there. Yeah, yeah, well, and we're pretty much there. So a lot of information here, and uh, I wanted to go through it uh, with about half the time. I think I scored uh, so that we'd have plenty of time for conversation and chatting. So you saw a lot of material there. Again, I'm not sure I agree with everything that Bill says, but... Uh, some of you may think that climate is, uh, you know, really not a big issue and we shouldn't spend a lot of time on it. Some of you may be at the opposite end of the spectrum. Most of you are probably somewhere in the middle. So let's uh, uh, bring that to bear. What, where are your heads at? What are you thinking about? What did you hear today here that you question and think is a misstatement? And what did you hear today that you're more interested in? And I'm going to uh, stop sharing for a bit and let people start uh, filling up uh, uh, the uh, chat with questions. Uh, and if we don't yeah, have... I'll, I'll uh, read um, as they come up. Um, first from Missy Showers, um, class 2013. Wants to know what the overall impact of meat versus plant-based meat is. Uh, I know some crops can be very water intensive. so. Uh, Tim or tomorrow, any thoughts on that question? I think it's, it comes down to the uh, plant-based meats, but also probably you could even talk about some things like uh, 
uh, some of the cell based means as well. Well, I think so. Um, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions for um, in agriculture, meats, especially especially meats, are very. Um, cows take a lot of. Uh, um, they actually emit a lot of methane themselves through their digestive processes into the atmosphere. Methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. Per molecule, it's like 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It's just much smaller concentrations in the atmosphere so that uh, carbon dioxide overall is the most important greenhouse gas. But um, methane is a a, and a very important greenhouse gas. The other, the other uh, crop that is uh, that releases methane is rice. Rice paddies, um, um, the the process of their growing, they're usually flooded, um, and in the process of growing, they create methane that is released to the atmosphere. So those are the two that I'm mostly aware of in terms of um, the greenhouse gas gas emissions from agriculture. Okay, so I, what I'm hearing the answer is it depends a little bit on which meat you're replacing and probably how what kind of plant you use to replace it with. Yeah, well, I, I yeah I think I think that's true. Um, I also, my answer is not comprehensive. I don't know what the implications are of different kinds of meats. Um, I yeah. just know the two that I mentioned are the details that I I'm aware of. And then I'll go to the next question. Joe has a question of how do you discourage the uh, Solendro syndrome? I'm probably mispronouncing that, but you know what I'm talking about. And the crony capital that can come with government programs. Any comments on how do you, um, I think the question refers to how you prevent subsidies, et cetera, that, to things that may not really work or weren't, were not work out in general. I yeah, and I, 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 I think I'll defer that to a politician, uh, which if there's one on the, call, on the call, feel free to jump in. But I, I don't know how to prevent that. I think that's a function of our political process. Um, I can just tell you that as we move ahead, uh, that may be a side effect or something that happens. What tonight is about is just kind of understanding whether we think climate change is an issue and what we would ideally do to solve the problem if, if we see it that way. Um, so I would not necessarily answer the question directly, but kind of punt on that one, I guess. And Sarah, Can I add just you, a note here? The, the, um, but what um, Gates is saying is that, has said there, is that the public money should be used for high risk things that people don't want to invest in. And in fact, the, um, public uh, investment for the PV panels, for the photovoltaic panels, was just one success that we saw. When the, pub, when the government has invested in, in new technologies, most of them have, have panned out. Some of them do not. But every investor, every bank um, looks at some of the risks and decides for themselves whether to put that money in. What's really encouraging right now is that an awful lot of investors and banks and uh, companies around the world are now um, thinking a little bit more about the risky investments because we really need to do them. This hydrogen in Germany, for example, is very, very funded by um, the governments over in the in the EU. Uh, and and the, uh, the trains that work, that's good. And once you get going, then the market can take over. Uh, that's exactly what happened with electric cars, electric vehicles. There was a public policy uh, and there was, I don't know how much investment there actually was in the batteries in the cars. Uh, I think that was kind of done privately. It, it's good that he talks about investing in, in innovation and research. It certainly is something that MIT is very concerned about, is that the government spend more money in research and, and trying these things that the market doesn't want to take, take up uh, the cause about. So I just want to give a little more time for the next speaker. Somebody just take a couple more comments from the chat because I think there's some good ones here. Um, uh, one, uh, I'll just pick questions. There's comments that you can all read. But um, uh, is there any research into how we can use the ocean to speed up the sequestration of CO2? I think you touched on that a little bit, Tim. But um, well, I can, I can, I can speak to that. Um, first of all, the oceans do naturally take up a lot of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. So the concentrations in the atmosphere now 
are much, much less than um, what we've actually emitted into the atmosphere because it has been absorbed by the ocean. But a few things, um, the other thing that's happened to the ocean, it has warmed. And so because of its contact with the warmer atmosphere. And so what happens then is that the ocean, as the oceans warm, carbon dioxide becomes less soluble. So that as the oceans warm, it's less able to take up the carbon dioxide than it was before. So, um, so that is one issue that it, it's a little bit difficult. As the things warm, you won't be able to use the oceans as effectively. The other side of that also is that um, a warming ocean, the, the water, when the water is warmer, it expands, its volume gets bigger. So that contributes to, to sea level rise. The other main uh, contribution to sea level rise is the melting of land-based glaciers. Um, so those two things together contribute to sea level rise. And so that's another impact of climate change. So um, I, I think that the ocean is naturally served as a way to sequester carbon dioxide, but I think we're gonna have to look to other mechanisms of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, potentially um, storing it in the ground. Or um, I think I was reading Bill Gates's book and his suggestion was potentially taking it out and then using it to potentially make plastics or other things that the things that we use um, or the things that we make. Um, but using the oceans that probably is not a viable option. I, I think the person who made the comment in the chat was talking about the possibility of fertilizing the oceans, causing plankton blooms that then sink to the bottom and you sequester the carbon in the plankton for centuries or millennia. Uh, but unfortunately, there's been some research into that to the, uh, that's discovered that if you fertilize you, with a rare nutrient, like let's say iron in the ocean um, and cause these blooms, you rapidly deplete other resources in the ocean to the point where they become the limiting factor on the plankton blooms and you have a pretty adverse impact on the overall ocean ecosystem uh, in the process of encouraging that much plankton to, to bloom and die. So uh, I don't think there's much um, opportunity there. It, it sounded good at first, but uh, it doesn't seem to have panned out. Well, there are some really good comments on this and, and you can read them in the chat, but I think now is a good time to transition to tomorrow. Uh, Tamar Ledley is a, has a PhD class of 83, um, continues, I think, to live in the Boston area and works both at uh, Bentley and Harvard. Um, she's, uh, I, I, she's a very long bio, but I'll just say that she's uh, currently serves on the Clean Network and the Board of Advisors of the Museum of Science, which I always enjoy visiting. And I think you can uh, start here. I'm going to go on mute as well. So I'll give you but, and that, uh, this is a little bit different than we had planned, uh, but let me uh, go ahead, Tamara. I'll put, I'll share the slide that I had. Uh, okay, set up go here. ahead. Okay. Um, you, you know, uh, basically, both uh, Tamara and I have been very involved with uh, trying to get people to consider uh, a workshop, and the workshop is entitled uh, Enroads, and and the uh, and basically the workshop is set up to. Um, help people understand where emissions are coming from and what kinds of things can be done to uh, address climate change. So with that said, Tamara, at your behest, I will quit sharing and you can put up anything you want. Okay. All right, I'm gonna put up. Let's see, there we go. All right, so as, as Tim mentioned, um, I, he and I have been involved in this MIT for Climate Solutions uh, group. Um, and part of that effort is an educational effort so that we reach out to um, all kinds of groups, educators, teachers, communities, MIT clubs, um, even businesses and organizations um, to help people explore what the most effective, um, most effective uh, solutions might be, and and so uh, the I, I run these workshops and and just to give you a little bit more background of how I came to this, I did get my PhD in climate and atmospheric science 
Um, I did climate science research for about 15 years and then transitioned into science education. So I've been involved for many years now in teacher professional development to help teachers develop a, uh, their ability to teach most more effectively about earth science and climate change. And so uh, at Bentley University, I do teach global climate change. And this model um, we use, En-ROADS stands for Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support Model. It is actually the second of two models that the organization that developed at Climate Interactive, so that's the, um, that's the uh, nonprofit, and it's in, in collaboration with MIT's uh, um, Sustainability Initiative that developed this model. It's a systems dynamics model. And what that means is that um, as you implement a solution, it has multiple impacts. Um, and um, as you add solutions, some of the so, some of the solutions don't they don't linear, linearly add to, to get to each other because some of them kind of compensate for others and so um, it's really useful to explore this this is the second of two models the first model they developed was called c roads the climate rapid overview and decision support model this is used in a what's called a world climate world climate negotiation simulation Basically, it's set up as a role-playing game in which you uh, divide the, uh, the uh, different participants into nations or nation blocks, and they negotiate the equivalent of the Paris Agreement. Um, and each nation or nation block has to make a decision about when they're going to stop emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, when they're going to uh, start reducing their emissions, um, and when they are going to uh, when they're going to start increasing their, stop increasing their emissions, when they're going to start reducing their emissions, and at what rate they're going to reduce the emissions. And then there's a few other decisions to make in terms of contributing to it or needing funds from a green climate fund and, and their efforts in deforestation and afforestation. But that only gets you so far. And the idea is now, all right, so you've got these countries committing to making these changes, but what is it that they're going to do to uh, implement those uh, changes. So we have this model here, and I'm just going to make a couple of changes because I think it's a little bit easier to see the impacts. We're going to change this here. And so um, this this graph here, oops, I didn't intend to do that. This graph over here says the global sources of primary energy. And this vertical axis is in exajoules per year, a unit of energy per year. And each of these lines represents a different source. So coal is this brown line here. And in the live model, you can roll over this and see what the expectation is in the, in the, in the baseline case, which is the, the world is going to do what it is going to continue to do what it's doing now with the slow progress we're making towards greener, uh, uh, greener um, industries and, 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 and society. Um, and the idea is, is that as if, if you have, um, if you continue on this, then the increase in temperature by the year 2100 will be 3.6 degrees Celsius or 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the, the Climate Solutions Workshop, we go through a process of, of, of negotiations in which people suggest solutions to bring this down. And actually there's one other graph I'm gonna change. Um, impacts to temperature change. And so here we have this temperature change. We have the baseline case that I talked about already. And our current scenario with no solutions is that's the same as the baseline case. And the idea is, can we get this number down to 2.0, which is this dotted line here, which is what was called for in the Paris Agreement, or 1.5, which in the Paris Agreement was, this is what we should strive for. So you go through this process, and I'm just going to go uh, just to show you how, how it works a bit, I'm going to implement the tax on coal. I'm going to subsidize nuclear. Um, I'm going to um, reduce, uh, reduce methane uses. Um, and so you can see that the impacts here are, uh, it, we've gotten it down from 3.6 uh, to, to 3.2 degrees Celsius. And you can play these, replay these changes such that you can watch how it impacted these various sources of primary energy. And you can see that, mo that even though I, we made these changes here, there's very, actually there's probably this one. 
would probably be, let me replay that one. Then you can see the impact um, of implementing a tax on coal. The other thing to notice about this is that the temperature change, while we look at it at this end of the spectrum, this, this year 2100, you'll notice that in the years 2020 to 2024, there's not a whole lot of impact um, uh, because these are long-term changes. Um, and as Tid mentioned in his presentation, this infrastructure around, around for a while. So even if you increase renewable energy, um, I, it, it's still competing with coal, oil, and gas. So um, I, I can answer questions about the model. It, it, it's pretty deep and I don't want to, to overwhelm everybody in, in just a few minutes about you know, all the ins and, and, you know, possibilities with the model. But you can look at different impacts. I've just shown you the temperature change here. Um, but you can go and look at the other one that I'm, uh, I like to show is air pollution from energy. This is not an actual. Um, this is not. This is. Uh, this is not an actual contribution to climate change. But by addressing climate change, you can reduce air pollution from energy. And if we put a carbon tax on, you'll see that it comes down tremendously. So the, the uh, particulate matter of 2.5, this is the EPA um, standard that uh, they address in, in their regulations of part, particulate matter that's 2.5 microns or smaller in size, because those are the size micro, uh, particles that can get into your lungs and cause health problems. But you can notice here that even though a lot of these things don't impact climate change uh, between 2020 and 2040, um, it does immediately impact air pollution from energy by implementing these kinds. So those are the short-term called co-benefits. The other thing that you can explore with this model in addition to those short-term co-benefits is the equity considerations. Um, and, um, and they are also within, they're, they're within the model that you can explore it. I just haven't gone there. So I'm gonna leave it at that um, and see if there's any particular questions. So we have some questions in the um, chat that I'm just going to read for the group, although any of you can read these. Uh, uh, William Collins asked the question of, uh, is your system dynamics model accepted by major governments or the NIST? I'm not sure what NIST is, but it has been um, the, uh, the CROES model I know was used extensively. That's the climate um, the uh, climate uh, negotiation model was used extensively with uh, the delegates at the, at the um, COP21 conference in Paris that developed the, the Paris Agreement. The En-ROADS model has been used um, quite extensively um, around the world. And actually that I can show you easily. There's... And includes a number of uh, members of Congress. Um... Absolutely, members of Congress, so that people can actually see where are the high high stakes solutions. So this is the model. Enroads model was released to the public in December of 2019, and since then there's been almost 2,400 events addressing 60 uh, 60,000 participants in 73 countries. And so this has been used extensively by governments. Um, I've also been approached by some um, organizations. I know that they did, um, and Climate Interactive did a workshop for the Sierra Club. Um, I was approached by L.L. Bean to help them think through their, um, their initiatives in terms of making their company, uh, what, what their company was going to commit to in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so the one thing to keep in mind with the model, and I emphasize this in all of my workshops, is that this is a global model. It makes the assumption that everybody in the world is doing the same thing. We know that that's not realistic, but some solutions are more impactful in some places than others. So this model really gives you a sense of what are the more impactful kinds of solutions. And Can you also uh, ask a related question? I think you're about to address it. I'm taking it out of order, but. Uh, since it's related, how is the climate model validated and how can we know, how do we know we can trust it? And I think you may be getting to this. Is this that's, a case a, of work? Yeah. that's a very good question. In a workshop, I, I can address that directly. I don't have the slides right at my fingertips now. What, um, 
Climate Interactive has done is they've um, they've drawn in developing the model. They've drawn on a wide range of um, non-aggregated model that takes into account not only the science but economic models and cultural models. Um, um, I myself am not an expert on uh, systems dynamics models, but I did do in my climate research career, I did do a lot of climate modeling. The way models are validated is by um, then comparing them back to um, the, uh, the either, either the climate data, if you're studying past climates, or um, predictions from other models that have more of the direct science in it. So those um, um, uh, it, it, disaggregated um, uh, models that involve the economic system and the and the cultural systems as well as the science. Um, they they uh, compare the results from this model and implementing the same solutions and compare them. And I have slides. I I don't have them up, but I can. I have their slides that show how well they do in comparison. And that's why. So when you look at those, then you have to draw your own judgment. If you go to En-ROADS, um, and so I'll put in the chat actually, um, the link to the site, um, where is the, oh, here it is. Well, the link to the site provides some of that information. Yes, you can about. find, it's very transparent so that you can find all of this, the um, uh, assumptions. Um, you can find the document um, that has the assumptions. Also here, I'll actually show you, here are the assumptions. Um, so you can go and click on each one of these and it'll tell you, and you could change them. If you believe it's wrong, you can, you can change them to what you think is right and see if it matters. Um, and for each one of these. Um, and then you can also uh, see what the, uh, you can also identify what the original uh, what the equations are that put this together. And again, and then the slides are available to show you how it compared to these uh, much more complex and uh, models that um, uh, have much more of the actual science and economics built into them. Another comment on this, I was, my Sarah was that this model for, the, for those of you who are interested who know him is, uh, was uh, cre initiated by John Sturman, who you many, many of you probably know is the Sloan School. Right, that's true. That's correct. I'm going to just go to some other questions just so that people get a chance to ask them. Uh, one question asked is uh, by Luke Anderson, class of 24, uh, course five and seven, which I believe is still chemistry and biology. Uh, how big a problem is apathy towards climate change? Yeah, and I, you know, there's some Yale studies that have been done. And uh, in the US, most citizens are concerned about climate. Uh, but most citizens are also unclear as to what they should be doing. And that's why a tool like En-ROADS or going through a workshop like En-ROADS is a, you know, a helpful thing for people that are concerned, but unclear on what to do. As I, can tell you, I, I can tell you based on the, the arc of my career, when I was a, a PhD student at MIT, the, amount of, the number of climate scientists that knew that this was a problem could fit in one large conference room. And nobody was paying any attention, and the climate scientists were really realizing what the implications of their research were showing. And it took a very long time. It wasn't until 2007 when the IPCC said for the first time that man was actually impacting the environment uh, and, and the climate, and that it actually had finally, that signal had finally emerged from the noise. Um, and people began to pay attention. So I don't think. I don't actually think it was apathy. I think it was either people just didn't trust the scientists. And so they felt that they knew better. Um, what I've come to realize over time, especially through my science education career, is that when the impacts begin to impact people individually, they become much more concerned. Um, and I, I served on the National Research Council's Climate Change Education Roundtable, in which we had one serve, uh, we had one um, workshop with hunters and anglers. And these are traditionally groups that didn't pay much attention to that until it started to impact their sport. And the fish did, moved from streams that were getting too warm to other areas where the waters were cooler. Um, and uh, so uh, they began to, to worry about it and whether or not at that time, whether or not they believed that man was causing the problem, 
they knew that they had to do something about it if they could. So I actually don't think it was more apathy, but more of a, I don't want to, I don't want to spend the money to have to deal with this because I don't believe it's going to happen. It's happening. Sort of a version of uh, all politics are local. If you don't see the effects locally, you may be less concerned and not willing. Yes, to right. Okay, fair comment. Um, I don't see any other questions. So just for the sake of, um, it's true that I, that, I, that I picked up on. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one had to do with EVs and competitiveness. Um, you know, the, the day a vehicle becomes a cost competitive thing for an individual is a little bit dependent on how they drive. So today, for some people, if they have the right driving patterns, an EV actually is cheaper to buy and operate if you think about total lifetime costs. That isn't true for everyone yet. But as we mentioned earlier in the uh, uh, PowerPoint, the front end cost of an EV is expected to come down in cost and be less than an, in, an internal combustion engine car by 2024, 2025. Once that happens, then of course, uh, because they're cheaper to operate, they cost less to maintain, the fuel is less. Um, at that point, you know, there won't be much motivation for somebody to buy a nice car. That, of course, assumes people get over range anxiety. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, people that make that step quickly get rid of range anxiety because, um, you know, they're pretty much powering their cars out of their garage. And it turns out, uh, even in the U.S. here, uh, the infrastructure is building out, certainly by 2024. Uh, the infrastructure for charging stations will be further built out. And uh, so I think that will pass as a concern. Um, yeah, I think I part of the question, man, I'm reading now, I apologize. I think part of the question is also without subsidies, would there be, would there be the same benefits? And, and oh, I, yeah. Well, it, it clearly, uh, without subsidies, uh, they wouldn't be cost competitive today. Uh, I think people that promote the idea of subsidizing EVs are trying to do the same thing that occurred with solar cells. They were subsidized, but now they are the cheapest form of, of uh, well, wind and solar are both the cheapest forms of power generation. Um, and it's because people invested when they were expensive. But uh, with EVs, as you bring up production rates, uh, you know, the uh, cost equation reverses. Yep, yep, batteries are gonna be a significant part and the battery technology is getting better and cheaper. Um, a lot of uh, what what the car companies did is they tried everything out on the high end. Tesla, you know, it just um, and so EVs are are now becoming very much more common. Ford just put out a electric truck, and when people see how the performance of that, uh, even the folks who aren't worried at all about environment or climate or anything, it, it is going to be a big draw. I don't think it's all that much more than a normal uh, F one fifty to go electric. I wanted to just stick in a, a word about thanking you all for coming. Um, we certainly could go a little longer if Tim and Tamara and Sroy J. Sreejoy want, would like to, but the uh, Environment, Energy and Sustainability Network uh, would be delighted to have, have you folks come again. We are not going to be doing a monthly webinar in July, but we will be back in August. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of information and resources, worldwide resources and things on our website. I did put the uh, link in the chat earlier. I'll put it in again. I want to thank you for that. And and I'm 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 out of things to say for this webinar. Thank you all for coming. But Sri Joy, yeah, thank, thank, it's thank your you all, thanks. To, first and foremost, to Tim and Tamara, as well as Sarah for for doing this. Uh, you know, we always like to get uh, people from outside and talk about different topics. Uh, we'll be on the lookout for another email for our late July one. We're going to have Peter Noseworthy, who is an MI, um, sorry, he's a Mayo Clinic cardiologist who's about to start at MIT to get his MBA. And I thought it'd be nice to invite him in. He's going to be talking about artificial intelligence and cardiology. And the following month, we're going to have a contrary view of uh, someone at the University of Minnesota, Constantine, who believes that AI can be dangerous in healthcare or can be. So be a little series of stuff. So again, thank you all for being here. Any other last words, Tim? Yeah, the only thing I'd say, uh, you know, 
Tamara did a nice job of uh, kind of serving up En Roads. Uh, you know, if people want to follow up with that, uh, you know, we could do it as the MIT of Minnesota Club, or uh, alternatively, if you want to get a jump on it, uh, you go out to the website, there's actually some seminars being offered here in their term, uh, right from Climate Interactive. Um, so would it encourage anybody that has an interest in that particular tool to get a better understanding to to do one of those two things. And I put my uh, email in the in the chat. If, if those two things don't work out, write me an email uh, between Tamara and I, we're always uh, offering uh, workshops. So uh, we'll try to clue you into the next one. Well, thank you and all for said, doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying with that said, back to you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. I'm gonna uh, let you all go and thanks again for this. <laughs>